world. Hello, hello. How are you? Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. This is your host, Monica King from Innovators Box, and I am super thrilled to have this conversation with you. Uh, as some of you have been here before at Innovation Unscripted, we've been celebrating diverse voices of innovators around the world to think about what it means to be innovative. Why is it that certain labels and, you know, kind of descriptions define and influence who we are. And uh, since COVID-19 has happened, uh, as, as I was navigating, uh, like many of you, the number one audience that I've been thinking a lot about has been my friends who are parents. Because on top of all the things that they already had to do with every other professional, now you have a little one or a big one at home that you have to figure out partners or as a single parent trying to navigate that. Um, and just reading the stories and recognizing that. I, I feel like there should be a deeper level of conversation and maybe some tools that needs to be shared. And so, so excited for all of you who are joining us live and watching this later on. And with that being said, I'm super excited to introduce you to some of my friends that I have here right now. So um, hello there, do we have our first friend ready? Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. As Monica said, my name is Yvonne Davenport, and I'm from Brooklyn, New York, where it is very hot currently. Um, I am um, rethinking creativity in reference to homeschooling my kids and also work-life balance. Since we've all been working from home, that's something that I've been trying to navigate a little bit better. Um, I am the parent of three young boys. Uh, Christian Jr. is seven, Tyler is four, and Owen, the newest addition to the crew, is eight months. I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Thanks, Yvonne. I'm Liz Whitehead. I'm the CEO of two companies, 12.5, and I'm co-mastermind at Diversity Masterminds, where we help diverse business owners leverage their certifications to get bigger clients and more of them. I am in Silver Spring, Maryland, so the greater DMV area. And in terms of how I'm innovating, I'm always devising new ways for my very busy entrepreneur clients to get the information I have, retain the information, and then be able to strategize and work with that information. So things like this, podcasts, trainings, I'm always looking for new ways to, to do that. So ha really happy to be here today. I'm a parent of two boys who are five and three. Hi everyone, my name is Yure Moon. I uh, live in Rockville, Maryland, which is really close to where Liz is, um, right on the DC, Maryland border. Um, I am innovating at work and home by operating with more grace and operating more from my human side as a parent and as a full-time professor at our local community college and um, just making sure that all the people in my life know that I am here to support them and care for them during a really difficult time and putting aside um, the typical aspects of, of being a parent and being an educator um, you know, temporarily and just focusing on what do you need as a human being right now? Um, I am a mom of two boys. I've got um, a six-year-old who just graduated from kindergarten and I also have an eight-month-old like Yvonne. Um, so things are busy at home, but lots of fun. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am Colleen Barris and I am in McGuanago, Wisconsin, which is about 30 minutes outside of Milwaukee. I am rethinking creativity in the sense of how am I having meaningful conversations with people as we are socially distanced and as we are immersing ourselves into conversations that are very uncomfortable and raw. Um, and so I'm doing my best to just kind of expose being human. And uh, I think that takes creativity and imagination and bravery and um, so yeah, I am the mother of a two and a half year old boy named Kieran. And I think all of that translates to him too. So really glad to be here. Hello, I am Nate Heck. I'm actually in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I'm in a tree house. Uh, some people wonder what this looks like, but yeah, that, it literally is. Um, I quasi share it with my kids. Uh, I'm kind of selfish about it, but um, I host a, a YouTube show. It sounds, makes me feel weird but anyway yeah it's a youtube show called outrageous with nate um you might have seen it on uh, pbs digital studios uh, i've been doing that for several years i also um 
basically creative direct uh, a direct a studio called second mile studios and a lot of creative storytelling and animating um, how am i innovating how are we not all innovating um, at home right now my gosh so survival I, if you can t you know tie that with innovation so a lot of it has been trying to uh, ad adjust myself for teachers that still needed and students and homeschoolers who needed content so my kids have honestly been helping me film stuff which is hilarious and fun and complicated but uh, additionally yeah just trying to make them and balance uh, you know get outside to do things but also balance you know getting all the e-learning done so uh, my children i have a 13 year old geneva 11 year old phoenix um and a eight year old zara and then uh we just wanted to add to the crazy of right now so uh, i actually have one uh who is uh being currently constructed and he he we just found out was a he yesterday uh is about halfway uh to coming so it's crazy so yes but i'm super excited to be here this is awesome so yes Hi everyone, I'm Marie. Um, I'm based in the Bay Area. Thank you, Monica, for hosting this. And thank you to all the parents who are willing to show all their bits, good and bad, <laughs> throughout this conversation. Um, so I typically elicit and leverage all wonder and curiosity for personal organizational transformations. Um, and I am a mom of two kids, so a 10-year-old girl and a five-year-old boy. Um, and how I'm innovating, well, as Nate said, who isn't innovating right now? <laughs> there is a lot of trial and error, lots of errors, and being okay with the errors. And I think it's a wonderful gift for the kids to see their parents um, erroring. <laughs> um, and really, I think one of the innovations that has helped through this transition is um, creating like little time buffers between transitioning from parent mode to work mode to house mode to personal time mode. And it's just like a reset button, um, whether I think I mentioned this um, in another conversation is just like splashing your face before you transition into one or the other modes. Or, or just something like that. So yeah, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Heather Hiscox from Tucson, Arizona, and I am the co-founder of a company called Pause for Change. And we help nonprofits, uh, philanthropists, and local governments rethink of how the ways that they change the world. And I have a 10-year-old son, Nicholas, and I have a 13-year-old daughter, Hannah. And how we're really innovating right now is uh, putting our empathy muscle to work really um, engaging a lot of curiosity and then a lot of experimentation, <laughs> being really intentional about what we're curious about, what we're trying to learn, how we can fill a heart and human connection with others, and then how we can try out some new fun things and see what works and what doesn't. Thank you, Heather. Um, my name is Emil Ekio. Um here in Indianapolis, Indiana as well, Nate. Um, I am actually the National Executive Director of the GEO Foundation. Uh, we own and manage charter schools across the country. Um, I have a 20 year old who's a sophomore at the University of Alabama as a student athlete, um, had to return back to school um, to start preparing for the season last week. So he's gone and my wife is worried death daily. Um, innovation, as you can imagine, we have over 5,000 students at our schools across the, across the country. And 98% um, of our students come from low income homes and backgrounds. So as far as innovation with COVID and schools shut down and um, virtual learning, um, trying to really keep the students in mind. We have students that are stuck in the homes, don't have parks to go play at. Um, so you're trying to deliver instruction, but you're still also trying to figure out how do you, you know, keep kids engaged? How do you keep, give hope to kids? And then we have 400 employees. Um, that have to find a way to deliver instruction and still live their lives. So innovation is key to everything we're doing from today onward, because schools won't look the same way. And we have to lead the way as far as how the schools are going to look and keeping the customer, the student in mind with everything we do. So every day is about innovation in my world <laughs> right now. Love it. Thank you so much for all the innovators for sharing their stories and why they are here. Um, again, for those who missed me at the beginning, I'm Monica Kang. 
founder and CEO of Innovators Box and your host for Innovation Unscripted. And today we're celebrating parents um, to talk about what it means to innovate. And as they have all acknowledged, I did it, you know, they said it in their own words. This is the time to be innovative and to think differently. And, you know, I want to dig a little bit deeper into that. And so I'm going to invite them all now back to so that you can all get to see them. And uh, uh, so now we're all here. Hello. <laughs> and uh, one thing to kind of note, you know, as we kickstart is that I know individually we've all shared, you know, this is what you do. Do. This is how you're innovating, but like let's let's kind of unveil a little bit of the curtain, right? Like that's that's like the phrase part, but there's a lot of like complication and like mix that actually happens in the day to day because at least the few friends and that I speak to every day, like every day is like a topsy turvy, like it changes constantly. There's a lot of patience and like my heart goes out to all of you. So to kind of have that first bit of the conversation, I would love if you have your pen and paper with you, if you can draw to describe your day, what it looks like as a parent navigating COVID-19, managing all of this right now. <laughs> so I want you to take a moment and sketch <laughs> to describe your day as a parent navigating COVID-19, managing all of this. And again, for those who are viewing, you know, take a moment to do that as well and share it with your friends as you're watching. Um, and let us know in the chat box, you know, what are some, how are you navigating COVID-19 as a parent? Um, I'll give these wonderful folks a few seconds as they reflect and it's like I feel like I mean, you need a little theme song in the background. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> And I'm already seeing from the pace of them looking down and still sketching is that it is going to be hard to just even describe what it is. Okay, so let's get started. Are we ready to share? Not yes. Okay, so when I say but three, I want you to pull up the paper to uh, and next to your screen so we can see your face in the image. So I'm going to say one, two, three. Can you show what it is? Oh, look at that. Take a look. Okay, uh, Emil, we're going to wait for you. You have your image. Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> you got to put it up. You gotta put it up. <laughs> no, just share it. There we go. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna actually, I wanna check in with Heather and then Nate, tell me a little bit more what that image is and what's on your mind. It is all over the place. <laughs> there's there's happy faces, there's uh, hashtags, which uh, for me symbolize some silent cursing. There's um, stars, right? Like, like just twinkling in my eyes. I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> there's sunshine, there's ideas, there's brightness, but there's a lot of hotness. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. So say, I think we're all in the same wavelength here, right? Like the day, the expectation of like something will get accomplished that I anticipated, not so much. So yeah, so it's just lots of like my result. No, that's whatever. Um, my ideas, the kids. And then there's just like the constant like, ah, like I think I have driven places and driven by them a hundred times because my brain is just like, what's going on? And okay, what am I going to get done today? And yeah, so uh, that's that's that. And I feel like that probably resonated more with the image that you were showing of some uh, Simpsons, right? <laughs> Did I catch it correctly? Oh, you're on mute. So I can't, we can't hear you. Sorry. So. <laughs> Disappearing to <laughs> the background. I use this because for the last four months, everything falls on dad, right? So I have to go to the grocery store. I have to make sure um, I'm, I'm the first line, right, of the fence for the whole house. So some days I just want to go high. <laughs> um, but it's been great, right? Um, just having the whole family in the house together. Um, you know, we've been separated, working and doing everything. So the last three, four months has been really special. Um, but some days dad wears everything. <laughs> and Homer Simpson certainly has a lot of good reference that we can pull in at moments like this. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that ties me though at the same time, I do know that um, you know being a parent is also extra meaningful, especially not only at this time, but at all times. And I think what I think about is that a lot of my friends who are innovators who happen to be parents, um, because of the way they have to think about life in a different way and the way they process things, uh, they tend to see additional insights. Um, and I, I, you know, I have huge respect and insight for that. And I'd be curious to hear maybe from a few of you, if you want to raise your hand and share, you know, how does, you know, being a parent influence the way you innovate? Um, and why do you think that's important that more people understand about it then? Um, yeah, Yvonne, would love to hear from you. 
Um, I think being a parent um, has forced me to kind of rethink how things look. I'm, I'm very much, or I'm a reformed perfectionist, I would say, maybe not so much reformed, but I'm trying to get there. And I feel like part of being a parent is understanding that it's not always going to turn out the way you want it to, but as long as you get to the desired result, no matter what you know detours you needed to take to get there, as long as we get to that point where we need to be, that everything else is fine. Like it, it's not always going to work out according to your plan. Oftentimes it's not going to work out according to your plan at all. And I think that's really one thing as a parent, you just have to be so much more flexible, so especially if you have multiple children. So you're kind of like juggling everything along with everything else. So it's like you have to be able to adapt because it's really like sink or swim being a parent. <laughs> yeah, Yvonne, I totally relate to that sink or swim feeling. Um, a lot of days I'm like just treading water <laughs> and that's okay too. Um, but to answer Monica's um, prompt, I think a couple of ways where it's allowed me to be innovative is um, I feel a lot more efficient because I have time boxed my time because I know I'd rather spend it with my kids a lot of the time. So I know that at a certain point I can do so much in an hour and that's what I'm going to do within that hour. Then I turn that off and I go to my kids. So I, I appreciate that clarity of time. Um, that's something that I feel they've gifted me. And the other thing I feel like they've gifted me is um, the sense of wonder, awe, and curiosity that I think um, can sometimes be socially uh, taken out of us as we go through school unfortunately, and just society in general. And so when they look at the world with these like big eyes and just ask questions nonstop, which sometimes drives me nuts, but I appreciate their curiosity because I'm like, I, I haven't taken the time to look at that and go, oh, why is a leaf green? And then it brings me back to my childhood of just like looking at everything from their perspective, like everything is so beautiful and grandiose. So it, it's really um, both grounding and elevating at the same time. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, and it kind of ties back to everything that you've shared about how it's really not black and white. And I think that the beautiful piece about it is to understand that, you know, in a way you guys have been prepped for flexibility for many years of whatever age of parenthood. Uh, it's just now exponentially amplified because on top of needing to traditionally be flexible uh, with COVID-19 um, and then also with uh, more conversations at Black Lives Matter, which we'll speak about in a little bit, just thinking about how do we make sure we have the space for as an individual, but also to have that as a family uh, with children and, uh, you know, loved your insight on the time aspect, right, to think about that frame. And uh, I want to piggyback right now on the comment section. We have Emily uh, Rosetta just saying about Emil, you know, she totally resonates with your Simpson comment because she was like, I have resorted hiding in my car in the Panera parking lot. And so I'm sure we all have our, like spots where we have to hide. I know I have a parent friend who's like, yeah, clot, my wife's clot is the place I need, I can hide because like, you know, kids are not allowed to come there or that somebody else is a bathroom. Uh, is there any other hiding places that you guys have done? Nate, I mean, you have the tree house that you're sharing. <laughs> Did you want to add to that? Is that actually a secret place though, if they're, you're actually sharing with them? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it is. It, I, it's an oasis, I won't lie. They, you know, I go up here and they usually know I'm working on something, but, um, but yeah, they'll come in. But no, I totally get it. I think, you know, and there's nothing wrong with like, you know, needing to go to Panera and hide out in the car. Don't feel guilty. I think we all need that. So. Yeah, but I think you, you have to have it, I mean, to get some space. And it also, like, I think it gives me time to reflect on, like, where they're at, what they're doing. And then, like, and my parent, it, like you were saying, I love that she just said, like, trying to space your time um, so that you're not constantly just being like, because I could get sucked into this space and just work, work, work and uh, forget that, like, oh, wait, they're here all the time right now. So, you know, like, yeah, definitely. And I'm seeing that echo of, yes, whether it's going to the car, making time, uh, you know, just making sure that you create those spaces. Um, so I'm going to tie that to kind of the theme of one of the things, you know, as a non, as the only person who's a non-parent here um, and thinking about my parents, the number one thing that I often hear about is the question of quote, quote, balance. Because honestly, it doesn't exist, right? <laughs> and one thing that, you know, just to list a few that I know, 
there's parenting, there's work, there's team, there's family, there's partner, there's uh, self-care. Yes, you should self-care. <laughs> there's everything else in life. There's other things on media. There's social media. Like I, that was already just nine things. Like I think most of us would like have our minds going crazy, which is a reflection again of Heather and the images and everyone else's illustration. But like, like you all seem to have at least figured out in one way or another, like what are some things that like has helped you navigate? Because right now, timing wise, we just talked about how hot everyone is at your location. Summer's here. People are now finally saying that we're now uh, online learning out. <laughs> we don't want online camp anymore, but it's not really safe to always go outside. Um, but like you still have work that you have to innovate. Like there's so many on top of it. Like we'd be curious to hear, to hear from some of you. Um, how are you? navigating this quote quote balance maybe liz can i hear from you first sure um i don't know that i figured it out except that piggybacking on what marie said in terms of time boxing i've actually been surprised how much work i can get done in the four hours a day i have to work because my husband and i switch off so i work in the mornings or he works in the afternoon or vice versa and how much work I can get done because I'm looking at everything and prioritizing everything. And then I'm just like, oh, and I'm off in the afternoon. And it makes me think about what was I doing <laughs> before this? And, and how much, you know, I, I don't think we're in a new normal yet. Um, I, you know, so we'll constantly be innovating to find out what that is. But I do think when we do go back that a lot of us, maybe especially those of us who are parents, will be excising those things from our lives that we're taking up time and not adding value. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with what you said, Liz. And I think that this time has stretched my kids' independence because I have left them alone. And I've been like, okay, you're on your own. Here's like a general sense of what you should do in the day. But it's really up to them to have the power and control to make it happen. And they're they're researching crazy stuff, like the amount of DNA we share with bananas. I now know that it's like 60%. I think we learned how many calories you burn with every fart. I know this now because my children are so curious, which is just fun. But I think also, um, I don't know how many of you others, I'm, I'm divorced and I have a new partner, but I share my children with, uh, with their dad. And so I've had friends say, wow, you're lucky and unlucky at the same time. Like, you get part of the week where you don't have kids around and you get to just be with your partner and focus on your business and double down. And that is absolutely right. I mean, those days I am head deep, deep, deep into work and relaxation and all those things. And then when they're there, it's a hard transition when they return. And I, I love when they return and they're amazing, but it's, um, it is hard. It's a rocky road of re-entry and then reprioritizing. So there's like a whole other layer of, of messiness that comes with that as well. And single mothers, I was a single mom for a couple of years. God freaking bless you. Single fathers, bless you, bless you, because that is a whole other range of heart. I interestingly have um, some things in common with Heather and some things not because I have littles, but I, I do have um, one son who is with his father half time. And then my little one is with me full time. And so I can totally relate with this idea of having to shift your mindset when your kiddos come back and maybe having a little more productivity, but also feeling like a piece of your heart is completely missing when they're gone. And so um, I can definitely empathize with what you're saying there in terms of allowing my kids to have their independence because mine are a little bit younger. I'm not there yet. And so, um, the way that I balance is that I just have to be okay with overlapping. So my, my sketch that I did a second ago is a snapshot of me just doing everything at once. Um, and my students, uh, they just have to get used to that. While I'm lecturing, I might be feeding the little one or answering a question you know, that the older one's asking or they're gonna have to be okay with the older one asking something really embarrassing or yelling out something like my butt is itchy, which has happened <laughs> multiple occasions during a lecture on grammar, you know, at the college level. And so, um, you know, I, 
I, I mentioned before and when we we're doing introductions that grace is really important right now um, in terms of receiving grace from my students that they're okay if both of my boys want to sit on my lap while I'm lecturing. And then also it pushes me to show so much more grace to my students um, that if they need flexibility with a deadline or if they've got something going on at home or you know I'm hearing noise in the background for them, um, that, that that's something that I can be understanding about because they're so flexible with me. So I don't know if I've necessarily achieved having a healthy balance. I just kind of like pile everything on top of each other. And, you know, thank you all for sharing that because in itself is a true reflection of what you illustrated at the beginning. For those who missed that part, you can scroll back and rewatch that um, of the images that they were describing about how it means to, you know, be a parent right now and innovate and do all of this. Uh, and so to echo a few again, just the reminder that, you know, we rethinking about time, being reminded of, um, you know, the the time you spend the energy and also just being aware of the questions that they raise. And that's an opportunity to discover um, and, you know, taking a moment to pause. And, you know, I'm seeing some of the chat boxes going on and the time was totally something that re uh, resonated. And you're, you know, even to your last point about how, you know, just being okay with all the changes. Uh, Jason Larkin, I'm going to shout out to you. He was mentioning about Parkinson's law is the, um, at the edge of the work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. Um, and shout out to both Liz and Mary, who has highlighted the law tries to explain how four hour could be so effective. And as many of you were nodding heads, I'm sure you found very creative ways to manage your time. Uh, and Emily uh, Rosetta also highlights as well, you know, we need to extend grace and hopefully receive it in return. And so all of that is, you know, so, so critical and um, hopefully more conversations like this so that, you know, we, uh, bring that out into the picture and it's not always like you know this hey this is the formula <laughs> this is how it works uh, which brings me to the other question um, is um, before I scheduled this uh, yes we had COVID-19 but we, we didn't had a handful of certain incidents and uh, in the past few weeks including George Flowell and a handful of folks have uh, we had Again, another black unarmed uh, individual who has been uh, facing police brutality and face death. And uh, it coincidentally at this time has rose to a whole global movement, um, which led in a couple of things, I think as a parent, which I'm very intrigued to hear, which is one, um, I know you've already been managing about what they consume and what they can't at home with social media to media content, even when COVID-19 initially hit. This is a whole different ball game where I'm now hearing conversations and even in our prep call, we talked about what well, we want to make sure we educate so that they learn about it. We don't want them to say bad things. We, how do we make sure they're not hurting other in along the way? But is it too early for at a certain age? Uh, I know some folks have said like, this is such a powerful opportunity. I want to bring them to the marches and protests, which we, I've heard a lot and seen a lot of my friends too. But I, I just still feel like there's a layers of things that, you know, that we need to un back all, um, to really understand that question of how can we have a difficult conversation in a thoughtful way, knowing that we don't have all the answers? Who would like to share? Yes, Colleen. Here. I'm sorry. Oh, Emil, do you want to start first? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so it's been um, a roller coaster of emotions, obviously, um, with COVID-19 and um, seeing so many African-Americans get affected by the virus and how um, the virus just exposed decades and decades of neglect in a lot of communities. Um, so having a young man, a 20 year old, who should be, who is excited about the world and his future and the things that he can do and having to sit down and explain why is it that so many, this, this um, virus is affecting so many African-Americans. What, you know, on face value, you could just say based on um, on um, health conditions. But I felt it was very important to, to really sit down and explain historical context to him so he understands how a certain group or certain, we all ended up in certain situations where our community gets affected the way it's affected. So as you having those conversations with your young, your son and you know, he's um, mad that school got disrupted and his home, sitting at home with mom and dad for three, four months. And then you're having this conversation. And as you're having that conversation, everything else happens. Um, I think 
um, the police brutality situation was bad, right? It was it was something we've seen before, though. What was more powerful was the situation in Central Park. Um, as a young man who's a minority at a predominantly white university, and he's always going to be a minority at places he works, to see someone um, leverage their perceived power to try to um, punish somebody for nothing, right? That conversation was even a tougher conversation, right? Because I know that my son will be in situations at fraternity parties or sorority parties or just hanging out on campus or whatever. And um, how do you, having a conversation on how you behave in situations like that, when you're not even doing anything wrong, um, that was even tougher um, because like I said, the police brutality situation, we've seen those things happen. So I've had conversations with my son when he was seven years old, you know, as far as just going out to play and, and, you know, as he got older and turned 16 and could drive as far as, okay, now that you're driving, if you get pulled over, here's exactly what you, you, how you should behave and act if this ever happens. So that conversation and what happened recently was nothing new, which is crazy to say. The Central Park situation was totally new because for the first time that got captured on camera, right? And seeing that so many people have been victims of that, where you're not gonna take um, the word of a, of a black male over a young female who is working her dog and she's at Central Park and seems like she belongs there more than the black man belongs there. Um, that conversation was so disheartening and powerful to have because, you know, it's almost having a conversation to say that even though everything is right and you are right, doesn't mean you're right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's such a, a bad conversation to have, right? But the fact that the whole world saw that, um, the fact that he as a young man also understood what was happening. And then having that conversation with him as far as, wow, you know, if that guy didn't have his phone to record that, what would have happened? So that's been the roller coaster of emotions. And, and you know, like I said, going through the COVID thing and then going through this piece where you wake up angry and you wake up sad and, you know, you want to do something, but you don't want to approach anything with anger. Um, so it's been... And then having a young man and saying, well, my son, 20 years from now, when he's 40 as well, and he has kids, will he have to be living through this? Is this something that he'll be have to, having to talk to his kids about, about how to behave around the police and how to, you know, somebody confronts you, pull your phone out <laughs> and record what's happening. You know, um, so those are the kind of things that, you know, I just said, it's been a roller coaster of emotions and having a young man that you know may have to live through all of this and praying that, okay, hopefully this doesn't happen in his lifetime, that this goes away. Um, so that's kind of been the conversations at home and, and how the times we live in today has called for those conversations, unfortunately. Emil, thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, I, I find myself in a, a very interesting situation in that, um, you know, when I became a parent, it seemed pretty clear cut that my job was to teach my child right from wrong. And it all seemed like there was this very straightforward rule book of what my job was as a parent. And now I find myself as the parent of a two and a half year old. So a little person who's not capable of comprehending really big conversations and also having made a recent transition from urban Chicago for many, many years to very white rural America. And so I have become very introspective in checking myself to say, how am I educating myself? How am I, how am I looking at myself and thinking about as a white woman, who am I and what have I believed up until this point? And is it right? Or have I been keeping my blinders on because it's been uncomfortable and I wasn't necessarily taught not to talk about race, but not, not to talk about race. And 
now I've been filled up with this new responsibility to have these very strong conversations with myself and my husband about how we are preparing ourselves to have these conversations with our child now. I mean, even when the news is on, even though he is two and a half, I still talk about it. I talk about it because I know that as a little person, he's still internalizing how we're behaving and how we're talking about things and seeing mommy and daddy educate themselves on who we are as people and how we're supporting our community and how we're making sure that people know that we think black lives matter. And even though I live in a very homogenous white community that just because people surrounding me look like me, it's important for me to say, I support the black community and that's important to share. Um, and I think because I live in this community, I'm gonna have to work so much harder to expose my child to people who don't look like him. And so it feels um, like I've been charged with a whole new set of responsibilities that I didn't even realize I was signing up for. But for me, it's also energized me to be like, okay, let's get real. Let's be raw about being human and acknowledging that we need to be educated. Um, so it's, it's been, the last 16 days have been very life-changing um, for me personally. Man, these are all really good. Uh, I love hearing this and uh, it's disturbing as well. And Emil, man, I hope, I hope that your son doesn't have to deal with that. Uh, but just to, you know, I mean, I think we're all talking about is like education. Um, I suggest to everyone, uh, the, the Color of Law, one of my favorite books I read last year, which is super powerful. Uh, as a content creator and a parent, it's a very delicate balance for myself because, um, especially for my, my older two, they, they are 100% engaged. Um, my daughter has covered our front porch and signs. Um, we live very close to downtown Indianapolis. So actually, two of my neighbors are African American. So She's just floored that he um, that they should even worry. I mean, she's angry. But then for me as a content creator, um, it's trying to figure out how to balance. And a lot of my audience are children to high school. So I'm trying to figure out how to take kind of the lens they're seeing it. And also through others who I'm, I'm engaging with and trying to figure out how do I make content that informs, um, but is also very intentional. I mean, it's hard for me because I really want to to just lay it out, um, but yet doing it in such a way. And this week is in fact uh, uh, a group uh, that I work and we pre produce. We're trying to be very intentional in preparing content for next year. Um, we are searching for, I mean, it's just intentional. I want to just do lots of innovators, uh, creators, artists, et cetera, who are African-American um, and really trying to focus on that lens because that way you, I mean, it, it, it all goes down to story, in my opinion. And if I can help people relate better and see themselves and their story, et cetera, I feel like that just a lot of times makes it a lot more difficult to judge uh, if you know the person, right? And you know their story and you start to relate to that. So I think it is, it's difficult. And, and embracing those conversations, I think that's what everybody in here is doing, which is awesome. And it's not easy, but um, I think it's, it's what's got to happen. So yes, very difficult balance. Hi, thank you, Emil, Colleen, and Nate. Um, I just wanted to chime in a little bit. Um, I live in New York and probably where COVID has hit the hardest, or not probably, I think it is, or it used to be, I think someone else took that mantle, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, being um, in quarantine and not being able to interact is also one thing that we're dealing with, but then seeing how um, even police respond to people that are socially distancing, but still going outside because either they're essential work or they have to go buy groceries or they just want to go for a walk. Um, the weekend of Mother's Day, um, there was a couple of articles showing like, you know, cops passing out masks and saying, hey guys, make sure you stay apart. And then in communities of color, they were punching kids in the face, like kids that looked like they had to be 14, 15 because, you know, they were in communities of color. And so you see that disparity and how police respond to it. And then on top of that, I work in um, the DNI space, diversity and inclusion at a consulting firm um, in New York City. And it's really hard to kind of navigate this because now that we're having this conversation about Black Lives Matter and a lot of companies have, you know, stepped up to the plate and said, you know, we value the communities of color, especially the Black community, Black Lives Matter, we're donating money, we're doing X, Y, and Z. 
those things are all great, but I feel like it, it won't really produce the change that we're looking for if it doesn't start internally first. So this is something where people have to get aware, like Colleen was saying, I have to educate myself and ask myself questions that may be difficult, but they're necessary. Like what type of person am I? What have I been brought up to believe? And how does that contradict what I'm seeing every day? Like, what do I feel to be true in my heart? And then seeing what's happening in the world, what can I do to kind of reconcile that? And so helping people who aren't, you know, people of color understand that being an ally starts with you first. It doesn't start with your company. It doesn't start with a statement. It doesn't start with a hashtag. It starts with you asking these hard questions and pulling other people in, like, you know, family members who may think, oh, I don't get this thing. What does that mean? And, you know, who may have questions as well, because those are the people you're going to, they're going to listen to you. They're not going to listen to me necessarily because they don't know me. And also they might think, oh, well, you know, she's black. So of course, black lives matter. But from someone who's not a person of color to say that to someone that's close to them and try and explain it, it really helps. So I think, you know, starting with yourself first and then try to reach out to people in your community to spread the message is really where it starts. Thank you all very much for highlighting that. And as I bring you back, you know, we, we've had some conversations happening in the chat room, just talking about Jason Larkin making a point about, you know, yeah, discussions with kids that are young, um, they're so psychological, emotionally developing still at that stage and to have those conversations is so phenomenal. Um, it's hard, but really important. And thank you all for sharing examples of how you walk that talk. Um, I think what's really encouraging is to hear that it, it's not about, you know, sugarcoating it. It's not about trying to simplify it. It is complex. We're as adults still figuring out because it's a systematic challenge, right? There is like bias under bias, but as innovators on top of being a parent, you do know it's possible. And one of the things, if we look in the innovation lens, which I know all of you care about is, you know, always asking questions about normal routines like that's something that we always just do as an innovator and it brings us i think as a powerful skill to think about how do we make sure we have these difficult conversations every day about anything and be thinking about that and planting the seed um, but kind of time to that at the same time uh, one thing i am curious to learn a little bit more from all of you is um, that question of like well at the same i feel like there's a lot to start and process um and oh just to Shout out from Emily as well. Emily's asking the question, a part of maintaining balance includes being able to set boundaries. Yes, how do you become more comfortable in setting boundaries with work and family, which is perfect, which is what I wanted to ask because it's one thing for us to, you know, as Colleen said, I'm doing the best I can to educate myself. You know, you know, as, you know I'm gonna make sure I take advice from Yvonne and Emily and like everyone else who like shares it. Like I wanna make sure I intentionally show up, share with my friends who are non-black communities and educate, but, Work is work, uh, family's family. Uh, it's the world still goes around. Like, you know, going back to my earlier point about time management was one thing, but are there other tips and advice that you do in your routine to kind of manage um, your space and balancing out all these different boundaries? Because if not, then you don't have any time for even yourself. Uh, we'd love to hear maybe from a few of you. Can I just start talking? Okay. <laughs> so, um, Thank you for asking that question, Monica. I think, um, you know, tips about balancing, um, it has a lot to do with making sure our mental well being is taken care of. And I feel like if our mental well being as parents is taken care of, then our children's mental well beings are also taken care of. Um, and then that spreads out to all of our communities. Um, but also being able to lean on people when you are not standing as tall as you'd like to is important. Um, some of the things that I do, so today is Wednesday. Wednesday evenings is my day. And so I'm married to my, hus I'm married to my husband <laughs> and to myself and to my kids. But um, so Wednesday evenings are my evening. I get to do what I want. I don't make dinner. I don't do anything. That's like my sacred time. And I will just like take an hour long bath with candles and read a book and sometimes go on social media. It's like whatever I want to do, or I can choose to work more if I want to. It, it doesn't matter. There's like no real agenda. It's just the fact that it's my time. And so I really appreciate having the support from both my husband and kids to be able to do that. Um, I also just like sit out in nature and stare at the trees and like try to not think <laughs> and just 
listen to the to the to the silence because people aren't in their cars as much right so there's a lot more silence in our neighborhood um and i think that listening to the sound of silence is really helpful for my very chatty overthinking mind So I'm really glad that Marie has the support of her kids and getting alone time because I don't. So maybe your kids can come talk to my kids about how to do that. Um, they find me everywhere. You know, I go to the bathroom. I did, they, they're just constantly banging on the door. Um, and I know that comes along with having little ones. Um, that somebody was talking before about going into the car and, and I do that. I step away and I go into the car and it's so funny because um, they found me the other day. I went into the car and they found me and my friends were like, why didn't you drive away? Why did you stay in the parking lot? So now I know to do that. Um, but I've also learned to not say sorry and to not ask. I just say, I'm going to step away or I'm going to take a shower. And I don't apologize for it because um, I think especially as moms, um, we're considered to be the default caretaker, the default this, the default that. Um, I know that's not the case in every single scenario, but in a lot of situations, that is the case. And, um, you know, I don't want people in my family to feel like, um, uh, you know, the, the role that I have is one that can be taken advantage of to the point where I don't have anything left to give, right? Um, and so as Marie said, you know, when we're caring for ourselves and we're feeding our souls and filling our cups up, we can be better parents. So I've just started flat out saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I don't apologize. And also I make very specific decisions about what I do with my nighttime hours. So after the kids go to bed, I can go to bed and get a little extra rest, or I can stay up late and be tired the next day, but also have some time to just paint in silence or write in silence or connect with a friend. And so I, I just have to be very mindful of where I'm at um, emotionally and psychologically and just kind of manage on a day-to-day -day basis what my needs are that day and those nighttime hours are really critical in terms of getting that time back or sometimes just going to sleep with the kiddos to get a little extra rest. Thank you for both sharing that which really echoes that again the flexibility theme um, which is all what all of you constantly do and constantly just asking the norm you know you know who says that you know, okay, maybe the car method worked for one person, but I need to change it for mine. And just looking out for those different options and making sure if you are able to put in your self care time, kind of structuring that in. Um, unfortunately, time is already up, coming up soon. Uh, I know it feels like we're just getting started because as you're all feeling both for the viewers and for all of us, you know, there's just so many layers to it. So while, um, you know, I hope that you do get to reach out and talk to these wonderful folks, they still have a few more additional things to share before we officially wrap up. But um, we're gonna be continuing these conversation with new parents uh, next week as well. But for the time being, just to connect all these different dots, what I hope you're noticing is that none of the conversations that we just had is silo. Um, and that's the very reason why even in that messy mind, we kind of weaved into all these different topics because that's probably the reality, you know, whether, you know, as a parent and an innovator, um, the beauty is like, how do we tie those two together uh, in gratitude of opportunity? And I know one of the things that all of you have emphasized both in your intro and uh, even in the prep was just, this is also a great opportunity to even have those conversations. Like if your kids are not home, even if they are young, you can't have the space to talk about these difficult conversations. They're at least home so you can talk about it and then decide, do you go to the protest? Do, you, do, do we talk about this? How, how do we communicate it over dinner? Um, and so with that being said, I'm sure you have some tips and advice. We'd love to hear all of you to share for the audience there, for other innovators as they're watching and trying to figure out like, this is all great. Like I need to figure out how to do better. Like I'm struggling with all all of these that you're all sharing, like what's at least one or two things that you share? And so we can, can we learn. Um, I think the, the two things I, I feel are most important is, uh, and we've heard it echoed in, in other responses in the conversation, but to just give yourself some time, give yourself some grace, like a lot of days, no day is going to be perfect, but a lot of days are going to look like a train wreck. And that's okay, because there's another day tomorrow and there's a another opportunity to get it right. And so I think we need to, especially as parents, but just in general as human beings to not be so hard on ourselves um, and to really celebrate the things that we are able to accomplish. I feel like oftentimes people don't really pat themselves on the back unless it's something major. And I mean, like sometimes the little things are enough. If I woke up at seven o'clock and didn't feel like 
I wanted to hit the snooze button 5 million times, that's a win for me. I'm not a morning person. So that is, um, I'm already like, you know, setting a bar pretty high for myself. But um, the other thing that I would say, in addition to being, you know, gentle with yourself is also engaging in conversations with your children and not just necessarily around the tough things, but just in general, you know, not just uh, because they're home, you can't really say, well, how was school today? How was your day? And you're like, well, I was home with you all day. So you knew what I was doing. Uh, so I think that, you know, it's really good to have conversations about other things like, oh, what did you learn today? Can you teach me about this? My son is really big into how to train your dragon right now. And so we made an encyclopedia and he was researching things online. So like there are little things that we can do together and having these conversations about what he's interested in and his passions. And uh, it really has brought us closer together over this time, just all of us being home together because we're able to do that as a family. I love that, Yvonne. Thank you. Um, one of the tips I have is from my mom who said at one point when we were little that she was going to change her name from mommy and wasn't going to tell us what her new name was. And so that bought her some time of first of all us being confused and then not knowing how to get her attention. And then it all, it works for a little while, um, especially with little kids. <laughs> um, but in terms of like, uh, you know, one of the things just bringing together everything we talked about, one of the things I learned actually from my company that I'm bringing into being a parent, especially when you're having, you know, difficult conversations and things like that, which is that you don't, you can start today. Um, and then once you've had the conversation, it makes sense the next time you have it kind of like Yvonne said about the day, it's not a perfect day, but then the day starts again tomorrow. And the same is true for a difficult conversation or a conversation you've been putting off. Um, I started my company right around the time of um, the, the Nazi rally in Charlottesville. And, you know, I, that was my first newsletter that I sent out was addressing that. So it was sort of putting my stake in the ground and saying, this is important to me. If you're not interested in it, you're probably not gonna be interested in, in me or my company. And, and to Yvonne's point, like it didn't start necessarily with the statement or my company values or whatever, but me saying, this is who I am. And I want people on board who reflect that. And because it sort of started that way, it became, you know, that it's not just scrambling at this time, like, oh, where's, where's my handbook? What do I put together? It's that we've, we're consistently having these conversations. We're consistently talking about justice and things like that in, you know, in ways like from the little engine that could, you know, why did those other engines not help out to, to really specific examples? So, um, so the, that's sort of what I'm trying to do, but I've really valued this time. The other thing I value is my support network of parents. So I, I've really valued this time with you all. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, Liz. It sounds like you're doing such incredible work. I definitely want to learn more. Um, something that I've learned as a parenting practice in the last few weeks is to change my expectations for my little ones. Um, this is not a normal or traditional time to be raising children. And so when I'm seeing behaviors in them, especially the six-year-old, the eight-month-old is happy as all get out because everybody's home and this is the best, he's living his best life right now. But with a six-year-old with such a sudden change in routine and you know just what, what he knows to be his everyday norm, um, I've learned, especially from a friend who posted something on Facebook about how her second grader is now watching Sesame Street all of a sudden. Um, he, he has had zero interest in that show for many, many years. His baby sister watches it and now all of a sudden that's where he finds comfort. And I'm so glad that I saw that post because when my son started showing some regression in his physical behavior and his emotional needs and psychological needs, I knew right away what that was about. And I had to dig deep and, and observe my own behaviors and the fact that I'm seeking comfort right now from simple, pure, innocent, good things. Um, I'm seeking comfort from people I trust. And so of course, my little guy is doing the same thing. And so when he's showing regressive behaviors with, you know, nighttime routines or things that are happening um, just on a daily basis, like insisting on doing story time with his baby brother and like reading the baby books, um, you know, instead of questioning that behavior or saying like, what's going on with you? Or why is this happening? I just let it all happen because that's where he needs to be right now. I'm encouraging it. I, I don't question it. I'm letting him walk through that phase. Um, and like so many of you have mentioned, 
during this hour about empathy and, and showing our children grace. Um, that's what I find is, is a, a huge lesson that I'm learning right now that I'm ho hoping that I will take into my future parenting practices as well, even after you know th this epidemic is over. Thank you, Ray. I feel like um, I'm gonna list, enlist you as one of my mama tribe people as we raise littles together. Um, so one thing that I've really held on to very closely and deeply always, but especially right now is the importance of delivery. So I think the way that you deliver a message will determine how well it's received or how poorly it's received. And I think it's something that our children pay attention to the way that you, especially as we are dealing with being cooped up in our homes and just feeling so claustrophobic that our, our, our fuses are, I think, much shorter um, than they used to be because the, the outlets are gone um, or we've had to become innovative with our outlets. Um, but really that importance of giving people the benefit of the doubt that if they are reacting in a way that seems defensive or curt, that it is coming from a place of confusion or hurt or fear or anxiety um, and making sure that, that I am setting an example for my child and how I deliver a compassionate and empathetic message. And I've had some pretty abrupt interactions, especially on social media. I think there's been this tendency for people to fire things off without really thinking about them. And especially as we're all so emotionally charged, I'm just trying to continue to hold that close of how is my message being delivered? Um, and even if my intention doesn't get conveyed, that I then have the grace offer myself the grace to say, that's not how I intended that message to be delivered. Let's talk about it more. Um, and I think oftentimes, especially as we are all feeling kind of this deep seated hurt, it's very easy for us to, sh to say something, to shame someone or to make them feel bad because we are hurting too. And um, so that's what I'm, I'm really trying to embrace is being compassionate with delivery and how messages are also received. Wow, these are these are really good. I'm I'm taking notes on everybody's things as they're talking. But yeah, these are great. I think just this, like I think we're talking about, is community, and you underappreciate it when you don't have it. Um, you know, not that your tribe and your house isn't your community, but as you said, you know, my fuse is short sometimes, and you're like, ah, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, for ourselves uh, here, we have front porch. We, you know, we're really connected with our neighbors. We barbecue outside. We do a lot of social quasi distancing doing that. Um, but I think a lot of it too is like, yeah, like I, I get parents that will, I, I think they assume because I uh, am an artist and creative that I somehow am constantly creating all these amazing opportunities for my kids when I'm not. Um, and I think that is part of it. Like give yourself some grace. Holy cow. Like your kids living, they ate today. Like, high five. You're awesome. Like quit putting, you know, social. Oh my gosh. We all have that friend right on social media. That's like, we built a boat on a popsicle sticks today, a full size boat. And you're like, well, thanks. Now I feel absolutely worthless. So yeah, give yourself some grace. You're awesome. Um, and then pivoting. I feel like it's like, that is a parent business time, pivot, pivot, pivot. And it's okay to pivot. Like, I think that is my new favorite word. Like I'm pivoting today again, instead of being like, I failed. Um, uh, sorry, I put this note down because uh, uh, in this, I don't know uh, how you all feel, but structures to a point, but also be willing to just tear the house down. So I think structure is great for myself, but then it becomes like, oh, I'm working till two and you're up here in the treehouse. Did you not get the memo? You know, like, uh, leave me alone. So it's it's also realizing, like, just relax. Like, I think like so, we have multiple people have said that uh, it's kind of amazing when you structure just a small amount of time, but you're like focused how much more you get done, which I think in turn in the future here is going to be amazing to see what that looks like uh, in the future. So yeah, you're awesome. Like give yourself, give yourself a break. It's yeah, you guys are awesome. So thanks for putting this together. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for sharing your tips and Nate, if you have a copy of what everyone's saying, I'd like one. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely have had a shorter fuse during these times. 
And um, I think my kids have picked up on that and also have sh had shorter fuses. So it's wonderful to have two kids where they can play with each other, but at the same time, there's more refereeing going on with two kids, right? Um, and so if I'm in the middle of a thought and there is dis disruption from the kids, it's easy for me to go like, ah, you know, and whatever, say words I probably shouldn't say. Um, but the other day, like a couple of weeks ago, I just like had this thought of when I step in, if I look my kids in the eyes and just start with you are love, not loved, because they know that, but you are literally love and ask them if what they did was love, um, they shifted. And so their response was different. They're like, oh, I am love. Like, is yelling love? Like, no. Is hitting love? No. And I'm like, well, what can love do next time? And so they um, have that conversation with themselves and realize that on their own. Um, and then I realize I also need to do that with myself when I <laughs> have the tendency to maybe uh, have a moment of freestyle yelling at the kids, like take a moment, look in the mirror and go, you are love, Marie, you are love. Um, so that's my little tidbit. And then the other one in our prep call is like a question I've been thinking is like, what would Mr. Rogers do? It's kind of like, how should I approach this? Like, what would Mr. Rogers do? Like Colleen, you were talking about like compassionate conversations. Like I think Mr. Rogers is probably like one of the most missed people in the world right now who could really help us guide through this. And so I just think of his energy um, whenever I need help. Great. Um, I, how I think about right now is that we are in a really important time of completely dismantling structures that we accepted as normal, that were entirely dysfunctional, unjust, and ridiculous. And I think engaging, my kids are a little older, but engaging your kids in that reconstruction that dismantling, identifying what it is, talking about what it is, what exists, what doesn't, and what could be. And it's setting them up as the generation of leaders to come, that we're doing all of our work to change the world, but what can they do? Like their brilliance is untapped and unrivaled. And so what can we do as parents to really generate that fervor and get them passionate about life and what the new opportunities could be for the future? This is this has been awesome, right? It's like our therapy. So this has been really good. Um, but really encouraging to hear um like Colleen talk about her her town and where she's from, right? And how do you how do you how do you solve the issue but by making it local? I think when you look at it from um from a global and national, you just feel like there's nothing I can do about this. This is I can't fight this, right? Um but when you make it local and say, what can I do in my town and in my community to say, this is wrong and this is how we should think. Um, I, I really applaud that because I think that's the best way to approach things like this. Um, but really the most encouraging thing for me this last 16 days um, was if the majority group in America didn't participate in the protests, those protests would have been over in two days, right? Most African Americans were getting scared to go out and protest because of the violence and what the pushback would have been. The fact that we, the majority group decided that this is wrong. I may not know the context of everything. I just know this is wrong, right? And I'm going to go out and say this is wrong. Um, we've had protests for two weeks. And we've had, we've forced people to make sure they respect the protesters, right? And the peaceful protests. Um, so the fact that in situations like this, that a majority group steps up and says, this is flat out wrong, and this is not the kind of world or community I want to live in. And we need to start finding ways to make changes. Um, that, that's really how we solve this issue and how we make change today. To say, I don't want my kids growing up in a world where similar things exist. But again, making it local, it's, makes it seem solvable. But when you think about the national and global issues, it's like, man, there's no way I can do anything. I'm just gonna worry about my house and take care of my silo. Um, so thank you so much. And this is this has been awesome to just see 
so many people that um, share similar concerns about justice. Thank you all for sharing that. If we can give a round of applause for ourselves and all the awesomeness that you have shared. And, you know, to add on that final note, as you're taking a look for viewers again, it was very intentional that you're seeing the diversity even in, you know, the presence of just seeing all of us here. Everyone, as they have shared their story at the very beginning, comes from all different walks of life. Their children are from different age groups. Uh, you know, they're in different cities, different locations, doing different types of work. But what I hope you're hearing through these stories and examples is that we we all have actions that we can take and every detail matters and just to recap a few again you know empathy 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 um, can never have enough of that uh, stay actively listen with an open heart uh, details matter language how you say how you use it small steps i'm going to echo back calling it absolutely amazing example to be reminded that you know the complicated it is go back and simplify um innovators you're used to doing that just bring that back to everything that you do in parenting and bring back the wisdom that you have in parenting and back forth and hopefully that permits cross-generational to connect the dots. Um, and on that final note, on the fun note, I know I asked all of you if you can bring a random object that inspires you to think of abundance in times of uncertainty, because let's be honest, this was a great conversation, but we're still gonna go back to our uncertainty and we need that little courage. So I'm gonna say one, two, three, and you're gonna share that with us. And viewers, my challenge to you all is that you're gonna have to follow up with all these wonderful folks and ask them, hey, what was that object and why did that inspire them? as a better conversation started, because I'm sure you're gonna to wanna to talk to all of them. You can reach out to me too, but you know, get to know them, ask them, and you know, who knows, there might be something else that comes out of it. Okay, are we ready to share? One, two, three. If you can share your objects, hold that, take a look, take a look. Okay, we don't see your face, awesome. So with that being said, this is Monica Kang from Innovation Unscripted from Innovators Box. I am so excited to have all of you. Thank you all friends who happen to be parents uh, who are innovators to have this wonderful conversation. Again, I feel like we can do many more. Thank you all who joined us live and hope we continue on. And again, gonna do a second episode with new friends next week. So come back, let us know your questions and hope you can rewatch this and get the notes again, as Nate said, because we got a lot of things to know. So with that being said, we will see you later.